Well, welcome and good morning. We're so glad you're joining us for our Lord's Day celebration. We're going to go ahead and open with Proverbs 6. My son, if you have become a guarantor for your neighbor, have struck your hands in a pledge for a stranger. If you have been snared with the words of your mouth, have been caught with the words of your mouth, do this then, my son, and deliver uh, yourself. Since you have come into the hand of your neighbor, go, humble yourself, and badger your neighbor. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hunter's hand, and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise, which, having no chief, official, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer, and gathers her provision in the harvest. How, lo how long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of your hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond, and your want like an armed man. A vile person, a wicked person, is the one who walks in a perverse mouth, who winks in his eyes, who signals with his feet, who points with his fingers, who with perversity in his heart continually devises evil, who spreads contentions. Therefore, his disaster will come suddenly. Instantly, he will be broken, and there will be no healing. There are six things with which Yahweh hates, even seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, a hand that sheds innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked thoughts, feet that hasten to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who spreads strife among his brothers. My son, observe the commandment of your father, and do not abandon the law of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart, tie them around your neck, and where, when you walk about, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep watch over you, and when you awake, they will uh, speak for you, or speak to you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, and reproofs for discipline are the way of life, to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of a foreign woman. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let, your ca let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for, for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom or his clothes and not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. Men do not despise a thief if he steals to fill himself when he is hungry. But when he is found, he must repay sevenfold. He must give all the, uh, all the substance of his house. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking a heart of wisdom. He, would destroy his soul. he who would destroy his soul does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out. For jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept any ransom. He will not be willing, though you give him many bribes. Glorious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your wisdom that you provide for us, Lord. Pray that you, you would, uh, by your Spirit, plant these words deep in our heart, and that you would move consistently to bring them to our minds, Lord. Lord, that, that you have taught us how to work for glory, Lord, that uh, well, we, someday we will work without the strife, but for now you have commanded us to be good stewards of what you've given us. Lord, we pray that you would uh, keep us from evil, Lord, that you would guard our hearts from sin, that you would convict us when we start to go astray, Lord. pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and open with a song. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Sing your praises. 
I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My debt to pay From the cross to the grave From the grave to the sky Lord, I lift your name on high From heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My debt to pay From the cross to the grave From the grave to the sky Lord, I lift your name on high Lord, I lift your name on high Lord, I lift your name on high Amen. I do desire to lift his name on high. I'm going to have a reading out of Luke 20, verses 9 through 19. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. And at harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers so that he would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine growers sent him away empty handed, having beaten him. And he proceeded to send another slave. And when they beat him also and treated him shamefully, they sent him away empty handed. And then he proceeded to send a third. But this they also wounded and cast out. Now the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I shall send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they were reasoning with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him, and the, that the inheritance will be ours. So they killed, uh, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these vine growers and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, May this never be. But when Jesus looked at them, he said, what then is this that is written, the stone which the builders rejected? This has become the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay their hands on him that very hour, but they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against him, against them. Lord, we are so thankful that you have made a way for us, Lord, that's... Uh, you came after generations of hard-hearted and stiff-necked people, Lord, and brought so many to life. Lord, uh, so many that never deserved it. Lord, that uh, we were enemies, God-haters. Lord, we had no way, no hope, and you came anyway and laid down your life. Lord, gave up everything for people who deserved nothing. Lord, we just can never thank you enough. Lord, we were so glad that you've made a way. And uh, Lord, that you've brought us into a loving relationship that will allow us to, to sit before your throne for all eternity, praising you for what you've done on our behalf. Lord, we just uh, continue to worship you, lift your name on high pray that everything we do and say during the service would be glorifying to you and edifying for us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Continue with our musical worship. given 
counsel to the Lord Who can question any of His words Who can teach the one who knows all things Who can fathom all His wondrous deeds Behold our God Seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore him. God eternal humbles to the grave. Jesus, Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our Nothing can compare, come let us adore Him. You will reign forever, you will reign forever, you will reign Nothing can compare, come let us adore Him. Amen. Be Thou my vision, O Lord. in my heart I keep 
King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, after victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, O Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Still be my vision. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. We have a Savior that has paid our ransom. Lord, we want to welcome you here today. And we pray. Word this day and upon our service that uh, you would uh, fall in love with your Savior even more today uh, than you did yesterday. Well, 
Our message today is the parable of the marriage feast and what a marriage feast it is. Uh, what a day this is going to be as we, as we look into this parable today and as we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us pray and seek God's face as we look into another parable today from our Lord's ministry and how awesome it will be one day when we will see Him. Father, thank You for sending Your Son, Your very best from heaven, to come and redeem us who are under the curse of sin and death. Thank You uh, that You sent Him to pay our ransom, and we praise You for that. And Father, we rejoice in the work that You have done in Christ our Savior, and we thank You, for there is no other way. And we're grateful that You have shown us the way, that You have called us out of darkness. And we're thankful, Lord, that one day that we will stand in your presence, and one day we too will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and what a day that'll be. And we praise you now and ask that you'd speak to our hearts, illuminate your word, blessed Holy Spirit, come and uh, keep us, uh, Lord, this day in your word. Uh, teach us the things you'd have us to learn and to grow, and uh, we're just so grateful to you. We do pray for all of our, our beloved uh, uh, brothers and sisters that are homesick and ask for your hand upon them. Uh, may you restore their strength. You are the great physician and uh, bring them back to us, Lord, at your appointed time. We thank you now and, and praise you in the name that's above every name, at the name of Jesus Christ. We ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, our scripture today is in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Uh, this is a lot of Scripture, and we'll try to uh, be fair to it and make sure that we expound on it in a way that would please the Lord. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in a parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been called to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. And again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been called, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and sent and set their city on fire and then he said to his slaves the wedding is ready but those who were called were not worthy go therefore to the main highway and as many as you find there call to the wedding feast and those uh, slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner, dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in the wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. For the chosen, you may sit down. <laughs> Amen? Well, beloved, don't get too comfortable. We have to move along today. Um, last time together, we looked at the parable of the growers. The father of the vineyard had two sons. He came to them and commanded them to work in his vineyard. One son said that he would not go, and the second son said he would. So then the first son ended up repenting and went to work in his father's vineyard, and the second, second son never went to work in his vineyard. In the parable, Jesus was speaking about Israel. In the end, he lets the religious leaders know that the tax collectors and the prostitutes who had been in rebellion to God as well had, re had repented at John's message and that they would enter the kingdom of heaven. 
the second son who represented the religious leaders who rejected John and Jesus' ministry, they rejected that Jesus was Messiah, the Son of God, from the tribe of Judah and from the lineage of King David. And this parable pointed out to us their rejection and how they failed to serve the king in his kingdom, which would lead to judgment for their rejection of Messiah. Today we look at the royal invitation, and this is a royal wedding. It's the royal invitation, and we have been looking at the judgment parables. There are three in all, and this one here today would be the last. The parable picks up where our Lord left off, that Israel has rejected Him, and the kingdom work has been given to another, which would be the church. God's servants had, have been sent with a gospel message to all people, inviting them to a marriage feast. In our parable today, the king is God, sitting on his throne, the throne of his universe. The son is the Lord Jesus Christ. The banquet is the great marriage feast. The marriage supper of the Lamb. This seems to only be here in uh, Matthew, in in Luke chapter 14, it mentions some of these, but that would be the Great Supper. But this seems to be the only place that this parable really with, from beginning and end are uh, explained. I just want to stop and explain. We do not try to make and explain everything about a parable. We can only do what we have. We just can't explain every single uh, every single bit of it because we're not told. But there are certain things, and especially in these three judgment parables, that seem to flow. And we're warned uh, not to uh, try to read too much into them. But these things we know. And so if I bring something to you, it's, it's, it's what these parables seem to be pointing to. And we understand that. So God's servants have been sent with the gospel message to all people and you'll see that in the parable today, inviting them to the marriage feast. And so, Jesus told the parable in Luke's gospel at the beginning of his ministry. That's in Luke chapter 14. And it was the great supper. This parable in Matthew seems to stand alone and is not recorded anywhere else. And I want to say about the parables that Jesus did speak many times about certain things that he did use the same subject, but not always the same beginnings and not always the same end. But Matthew is a complete from beginning to end for us. Each parable has its own lessons and truths. We need to remember that. In our parable, we will see that God's gracious offer in the general call of the gospel is to both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus will inform them that in the end, without His righteousness, which comes through salvation, by faith alone, through Christ alone, uh, then judgment awaits. Anyone who rejects His general call awaits the judgment day where they will have to give an account. Uh, we will again look at how His listeners would have understood this teaching. And that's very important that we understand his listeners here would be the religious leaders, but the crowds were close by as well. So in our parable today, we can see a large overview. I want to give you a large overview. I've given you some points in the bulletin. But a large overview, we can see this in two main points, and you'll clearly see it. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, 22, verses 1 through 7, Jesus tells us about those who despise the king and would not come to the son's banquet. And the second half, then, two major uh, uh, parts of it, the second half of his teaching in verses 8 through 14, which tells us who did come and the results of them coming. So we see it broken down that way. So those who were called to the marriage is Israel. This is the picture. This may also apply to anyone who denies that Christ is Messiah. The Son of God sent, uh, the Son of God sent to die for those who would believe. You see, those in the highways, we'll see that in our, in our parable, this is both the Jews and the Gentiles, some from other nations. Uh, Jesus said, both evil and good. We'll look at all of this. 
Now remember, we're just a few days away from the Lord's crucifixion. And so there are a lot of people here, a lot of Gentiles and a lot of Jews have come in uh, for the Passover. So the wedding garment is Christ's righteousness. And you'll see all this in the parable. The king is God, the son is Christ himself, and the great marriage feast is the day of redemption for the believers. That's what, the, that's what that great meal is all about. Uh, we will dine with him in heaven as there will be a tribulation upon this earth. So our outline in your bulletin, let's, uh, let's look at our first point then, the parable in verses 1 and 2. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. As Jesus teaches here by another judgment parable, as I mentioned, the last one in three, this is called the trilo Trilogy, the kingdom of heaven, one writer says this, and I really want to sh uh, share this with you, and this is John MacArthur, but we say one writer says, although they, that is the Jews, had many perverted ideas about the kingdom of heaven because the term heaven was so often used as a substitute for the covenant name of God, Yahweh, or Jehovah. Most Jews would have understood that it was synonymous with the kingdom of God and represented the realm of God, God's sovereign reign. That's what they would understand. There are past, present, and future as well as temporal and eternal aspects of the kingdom. We understand that. But it is not restricted to any era or period of redemptive history. It is the continuing, the ongoing sphere of God's rule by grace. Amen? And that's the picture. And in a narrow sense, the phrase is also used in Scripture to refer, refer to God's dominion of redemption, His divine program of gracious salvation. And you could see that and you could think through that when you hear about the kingdom of heaven and you hear about eternal life, they're synonymous. Uh, that's for those uh, that God has called and prepared a prepared people for this particular feast that we're looking into today. And this is for all those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. As Jesus uses the phrase here, it specifically represents the spiritual community of God's redeemed people, those who are under His Lordship in a personal and unique way because of their trust in His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we're already in the kingdom of heaven. It's as if we're there already, but not yet. And that's how it is, beloved. So then it says that we're seated in high places with Christ, the Scripture. So then the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And some theologians see this parable in four scenes, so I thought I'd mention that to you. I will point them out to you as we move along. And so the first scene then would be in the words, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. That would be the first scene. So that would be an opening scene for the Jews. They would understand it this way as well. Uh, Jesus compares the marriage supper of the Lamb to a marriage feast. However, as, as we will see, this was no ordinary marriage that the Lord speaks about. And it certainly will be in heaven, won't it be? It won't be anything ordinary. It was a king and his son. I mean, who does that sound like? It's God and his son. On the spiritual side, as we start to think both ways now, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. This celebration in heaven is a picture of Christ and His church. The marriage, this is the church, and the church is the bride of Christ, amen? Amen. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 9, 15, if you remember, they came and questioned Him, and Jesus said to them, can the attendants of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will, 
and then they will fast. Remember, the question was about fasting. And He is the bridegroom. Well, we're the bride, amen? We're the bride of Christ. And what a day that'll be. In John 3, 29, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, and that's Christ and us. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears Him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. So this is Jesus Christ. We're not tying things together that aren't there. That's the picture. We understand that the wedding is a picture of the bride and the groom who are in a covenant with God. A man and a woman are in covenant with God. Beloved, no matter what, if they're not even saved, they're in a covenant with God. If it is a man and a woman, but that is the way God has designed it. So here we hear about the marriage covenant and the covenant of faith. This is salvation, and that is all the work of God. We know God's plan for the marriage covenant is a union between a man and a woman, and that is to be for life, a life here on this earth. The covenant of faith is a union with Christ, which is between the believers of Christ, the redeemed bride, and this is forever as well. Only this is eternal. It's major. It's beautiful as it is compared. Beloved, as you know, our Lord has been teaching, preaching, healing all kinds of people, doing all kinds of miracles, raising the dead. This is at the end of His life. The Messiah, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world, Jesus offered Himself and His kingdom to the people of Israel. That's the picture here. And they've rejected Him. But they have rejected Him, and they are not in this covenant of faith or with union with Christ, which is between the believers and Christ. And you see that clearly. Beloved, there are two calls, and we're going to break these verses down. This is an overview. There are two calls I mentioned earlier. The one is called the effectual call. And this is the supernatural work of God's saving grace. If you've been saved by grace, then you have had an effectual call. It is what God did to call you out of darkness. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And God had mercy on us, and He called us. That's the effectual call. The second call would be what we call a general call. And the general call, that is different in scope and effect from from the effectual call. The general call that goes out, this call goes out when the gospel is being preached and is offered to all people like you'll see in our text today. The effectual call goes only out to those God has chosen and appointed for salvation. That's what Scripture teaches. Amen? That's, yeah, that's the call you received. If you didn't receive that call, then you're not saved. The general call can be rejected where the effectual effectual call cannot be, okay? When God is working, then for sure you're going to be saved. You see, the Jewish wedding feast normally lasted about a week. And the father of the bridegroom would have a series of meals for the guest, But for a royal wedding, for a king and his son that our Lord speaks about here in the parable, this feast would last for three or more weeks. This is not a normal ceremony, a wedding uh, ceremony. And while uh, while this feast was going on, the guest invited could even stay in the palace of the king. This came with with some really uh, awesome benefits. So this event more than likely would be something that not many at the time that Christ is speaking here would have attended. Most people would not have attended this kind of a royal a wedding, but they would have understood it. So this particular event that we're looking at, this particular feast, this event more than likely would be something that not many at this time would have attended. However, they would have heard about it. And when the king had made everything ready, he says, 
he would send his slaves to let all the guests who had been invited know that it was time to come. The were, uh, this would be the second invitation, beloved, of the Lord. So this is the second invitation that the guests would have received. The first would have told them about the event that was coming up, and the second would be to tell them that everything is ready, come now to the banquet. And so as we're understanding the time and the people, so this would be the second call then that would go out. In the opening scene, we can see that God is the king and he has invited Israel, but, but they rejected his offer. So let's look now at our second point. It's God's invitation to Israel. In, in Matthew 22, 3, we read, and he sent out his slaves to call those who have been called to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Unwilling to come. Remember, they had already been invited in uh, verse 3. The words, them, that were called, refers to the fact that Israel had already been invited. It's pointing us to Israel. And the picture here is that they were called, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, through Abraham. In Genesis 12, 1, we read, And Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your land and from your kin and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Israel was called. They were part of Abraham. They, they, they like to say that, that Abraham is my father. Beloved, again, those religious leaders who were listening into the parable at this point would think, how would someone be unwilling to come? This would be a major uh, thought for them. And they would say, is this even possible? How is this possible that this great feast, this royal feast by a king who has all power, how is this even possible that they would refuse the offer? It's just beyond. It would be beyond their, their belief. They even responded, uh, as we know, um, and you may remember the parable before this, the Lord draws His listeners into the parable of the wicked vine growers, and they even responded, who would refuse such an offer? And remember that this invitation was a picture that God had sent to the upright religious Jews in the nation of Israel. The call went out, and this is all about Israel, and it's all about God's chosen people. That's the picture that we have before us. And it is not only the religious Jews that have rejected Jesus Christ, but it is the, na the nation as well. It is the people. And you'll see that at the cross. So here we see one of, one of the unique elements in, in the willful refusal of those who were invited to the wedding banquet. It's very unique in its, in its text, and it would be one of those shocks uh, to the hearers. So the Lord says in verse 4, again, He sent other, out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been called, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready to come to the wedding feast. So the king wants to remind the invited guest, Israel, Remind them that the dinner is ready. Come to the wedding feast. This is the time. And this would be the third invitation. He tells them of this great feast and all he has done to prepare for it. Listen to the words there. The servants were set, sent forth. You can see that. And look at what has been prepared. My oxen and my fatted livestock, and all, they're all butchered and everything is ready Come to the wedding feast. Everything is waiting. The servant sent forth here is a picture of the prophets. You can see this. A John the Baptist and the 12 apostles plus the 70 that our Lord had sent out to prepare the way for Christ. We read in Matthew 10, 5, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Prepare. And they were not prepared. 
Let's look at their response in verse 5 of our text. But they paid no attention and went their way out to his own, one to his own farm and another to his business. This is unthinkable, beloved of the Lord. It's unimaginable that a royal feast of a king, and they would not come, and they would make excuses. They paid no attention, the Bible says. We see that the king is patient uh, in the text as he sends word again to come. He didn't have to send that. And you could feel his concern and his compassion. And he did. He wept over the city of Israel and over his people. However, the kings of the past were not as patient as this king was. This is most shocking in the parable because they would have thought right away, if you're listening and you're, you're one of these religious leaders, cut head off. King is going to cut everybody's head off. Everybody's going down. The king sends word. The king prepares all the meal and no one is coming and they make some, some excuses on why they can't come. It's unthinkable. It's unthinkable. They paid no attention. In verse 5, uh, they here, the word they is speaking of Israel, and they would not come. Israel would not come to her Messiah. He came unto his own, and his own rejected him. They is speaking of Israel. Let's look at the reasons given for their rejection of the offer. They, it says, made light to not come. They were careless. They were making light of the invitation. How do you do that? How do people make light of the invitation as it's giving out in the general call, the gospel is given out, and people reject the call of Jesus Christ? You see, the farmer was too busy. The merchant was too busy. And this is a picture of all men who are also too busy when the general call goes out, and one day it will be too late. And today could be that day. The Lord can't, uh, could return at any time and come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? So Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And we can also see in the general call of the gospel in Luke 8, 14, in the sower and the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. Notice, that's the general call. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of life and do not bear ripe fruit. That's exactly what the Lord is talking about. He talked about that in the previous two parables a fig tree being cursed, and of course with the two sons. Unbelievable as we think through this. But they were choked with the worries and riches and pleasures of life, and they don't bear any fruit. Remember, that's what this is. It's Israel, God's chosen people, who are to bring the message of God throughout the world. So in our text, we can see the rejection of those who pointed, pointed uh, the way to Christ, the slaves. Those are the prophets. In the rejection of Christ, uh, of Christ by the leaders, the nation of Israel. So then in verse 6, they killed the king's servants. And again, a picture of the prophets. A John the Baptist who was rejected and beheaded. A Jesus Christ the Son of God was rejected and crucified. And beloved, after the resurrection, this continues. The apostles were rejected and persecuted. All of them died except for John. And we could see the truth Christ portrays in the rejection of the, reject of the uh, religious leaders, and we can see that it continues on. And beloved, it continues on today. There are being, people being martyred for Christ today. But listen about what Paul helps us with. Paul says in Romans 10, verses 2 and 3, For I testify, testify about them that they have a zeal for God. Who are they? This is Israel. This is the Jewish people. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. 
that they're going to kill Jesus Christ and think that they're doing God's work. Jesus warned them about that. For not knowing about the righteousness of God, now speaking about salvation, for not knowing about the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And so they rejected the king. They rejected the king, God, and they rejected the king's son, Jesus Christ. They killed the prophets. We looked at that last time together. We went and looked at uh, Isaiah who was put in a tree, a hollowed out tree, and sawed in half. We, we looked at other prophets as well, and you could see that. You can almost say through Scripture, if you see a prophet of God being killed, he's a true prophet. And you can see that, can't you? Beloved, of these religious leaders, one writer says, it was not that they could not come, but rather they would not. Understand that in your text. It says they could not come. No, they would not come. They would not bow on bended knee before Jesus Christ, who is the prophet, priest, and king. Oh, they would not. They refused to. And in verse 7, how sad that they had Jesus Christ standing right in front of them, but yet they rejected Him and His gospel, the gospel call. They refused to come. And we see the same thing today when the gospel is preached. Oh, beloved Spurgeon, on our particular parable, I believe he had four messages. And, uh, but C.H. Uh, Spurgeon says this on our verse, and listen to this, it breaks our hearts. And I know as parents, we relate. Today, the same class will be found among the children of godly parents, dedicated from birth, prayed for by loving parents, listening to the gospel from their childhood, childhood and yet unsaved. We look for these to, uh, to come to Jesus. We naturally hope that they will feast upon the provisions of grace, and like their parents will rejoice in Christ Jesus, but alas... Spurgeon says, how often is it the case that they will not come? A preacher may be too rhetorical. Let a plain-speaking person be tried. Let another come with a parable and an antidote. Alas, with some of you, the thing wanted is not a new voice, but a new heart. And you would listen no better to a new messenger than to the old one, O oh, beloved, Israel had rejected their king. All the signs were there. They refused to acknowledge their Messiah king. So he became a suffering servant. Israel had rejected their Messiah king and he was sent by his father to be as Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant of Yahweh. In Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, we read, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising for our peace fell upon Him, and by His wounds we were healed." All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Christ. And that happened when Jesus Christ was pierced and placed on our cross. Christ died in our place. He became our substitute. He took the wrath of God and He took the wrath of God for all of our sin, for those that He would save. Oh, what a Savior. What a beautiful Savior. What a precious Savior. Amen? He's sufficient in all ways. So, beloved, that was the first, that was the first scene. Now, the second scene is in Matthew 22, 7. But the king was enraged, and you could see the scenes and how they do flow. 
But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set the city on fire. In verse 7, God judged Israel, his chosen people, who have rejected him. The king sent his army. The king recognized that in their failure to come, this was the rejection of him and his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And God knew this before the world was formed. So, two things here spoken about in our verse. The rebels are destroyed and the city was burned. You can see that. And this refers to the future destruction, point A, of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And this is when Titus uh, came in, and, and it is said that 1.5 million Jews died and the city temple was burned. You remember, they burned the temple of God to be able to get all the gold. And that's why they burned it. They burned it so all the gold would drip. And it says that not one stone would not be overturned. That's because the gold went down and every stone, and between every stone, they wanted to get every drop of gold. And so Titus destroyed the temple. Titus slaughtered the people, and he burned the temple. And this may be true, however, beloved of the Lord. A Christ speaks of a future day, because this, in our understanding of 70 AD, falls short of what Christ is speaking here in His fullness. Jesus was primary, primarily referring to the eternal judgment that will take place in the future. And beloved, the Scripture bears witness as we move down toward the verses. And that's why there will be weeping. And that's the judgment. And that is the outer, uh, the outer uh, judgment. That's where they will end up along with Satan and all of his dominions. And then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. So you can kind of see the shift. And in the first seven verses, we heard about those who were invited and who despised the king and would not come. The general gospel call went out time and time again to Israel and they rejected the call. The guests had no excuse for not arranging their lives to make time to go. Beloved, we see this in our lives, and people don't have time to go to church. Even those that, that say that they're Christians, they don't have time. Oh, they'll tell me, well, you don't understand, Pastor, that's my only day to get rest. That's the only day that I can get all my things done. And of course, I'll have to remind them that they will have to stand before the throne of God, and God will not receive that for an excuse. For His Word says not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. But in the, in, the, in the full sense, beloved, most people don't want to hear about Christ. They don't want to hear about heaven. They don't want to hear about hell. They're too busy living this life here. And we know that. We hear it all the time. Oh, no, I'm too busy. And we see this in the lives of the people that don't have time to go to church and, and have time to seek God's face. I asked C.H. Spurgeon to help me there to, to illustrate a small quote that has major impact on our thought. He says, C.H. Spurgeon told an interesting story about a ship owner who was visited by a godly man. The Christian asked, well, sir, what is the state of your soul? To which the merchant replied, soul? I have enough to do just taking care of my ships. But he was not too busy to die, which he did a week later. Let's look at the second half of Christ's teaching for those who did come. We will look at the call I spoke of earlier in an invitation. It's an open invitation that the king gives to everyone. In point three, God's open invitation, Matthew 22, 8 
through uh, 10. And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were called were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, call to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, but both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Well, beloved, in verse 8 here, we're, we're looking at, uh, at these verses, the king tells his slaves they were not worthy. You see that? And it's striking. Uh, so their ears would have went up, and ours, ours do as well. This unworthiness was not based on any merit. It never is based on merit, but solely on the king's gracious favor. That's the invitation. As they were unworthy because they refused the invitation of God to come to His Son's wedding, which is the banquet. The same would be said when the gospel go for, goes forth and people will not believe. We understand God's work, but man is held accountable as well. And they will not believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. Now, here we have Jesus standing before them with all the credentials of a Messiah. Oh, no man ever spoke like He did. No man ever taught like He did. No man ever did the amount of miracles that He did. In fact, there is no man except Jesus Christ. No one had the, the birthright and the credentials that Christ had. But yet they rejected the gracious, gracious offer of God. You see, they were unworthy because they refused... The, the invitation of God to come to His Son's wedding, to come to the feet of Jesus Christ, to repent and call upon Him as Lord. No one is worthy, beloved. And no one is worthy, but God is rich in mercy. That anyone would be saved is a picture of God's amazing grace. That any man ever in all of history, including Adam and Eve, that would be saved is God's amazing grace. God owes man nothing. We are sinners in need of God. Man needs a Savior. And God sent the Savior from heaven to save us. He did what no one can do. They were unworthy because they refused the invitation of God to come. And this was standard on how they treated His Son, Jesus Christ, throughout His ministry, by the way. It's right at the beginning of his ministry. They wanted to kill him right from the moment go. Beloved, God had first chosen his people through Abraham, whose descendants would be blessed and who would bless the rest of the world. And after the 400 years in Egypt and the chosen people were delivered by God through Moses, the wedding promised blessings to Israel. Israel knew this, by the way, beloved of the Lord. They knew this. They knew that they were blessed through Abraham, their father. Not spiritual for many of them, as Jesus spoke out. However, because they rejected the son, they would be cast out of the kingdom temporarily. And that's what we're reading about in our text. You can only wonder what they might have been thinking. They knew the Old Testament scriptures that said Messiah's coming would be accompanied by a great banquet. And this banquet would be for His chosen people. Beloved, that's all of us. That's anyone from, from Adam and Eve on. Even though Israel is called His chosen people, anyone that receives an effectual call, either in Old Testament or New Testament, is saved by faith alone through Christ alone. Amen? And then we are His chosen people. He chose us in Christ Jesus. So let's look at the third scene. This arrives to us in verse 10. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. And He commands His servants to go therefore to the main highways, as many as you find there, call to the wedding feast. So let us look now at the guests who were finally invited after the first group, Israel, rejected. And he said, go everywhere, everywhere, and invite everyone. 
to the banquet of the king's son. And beloved, you know the picture here. The picture is of the great commandment and the great commission. This is exactly what the church would do after they were empowered on the day of Pentecost. This is exactly what we would do. In Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This picture also Paul will speak about, but the prophet Hosea spoke about in chapter 2, verse 23 of Hosea. And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will also have compassion on her who had no, not obtained compassion. I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. Uh, Paul quotes this from Hosea, and he quotes it in Romans 9, 25 through 26, and I understand it's, it's pretty much repeating it, but let's look at that. And he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, uh, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. In Romans chapter 9, we hear that the restoration is necessary for Israel, but my people and her who was not beloved. Paul says in Romans, follow along, 11.11, 11, I say then, did they stumble so as to fall? Israel, the Jewish people, may it never be, you know Paul's heart, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And that's the picture that we're seeing, to make them jealous. The Gentiles were to make the Jews jealous. And this is what our Lord points our attention to in our parable. Jesus says in the parable, invite good and evil. Invite good and evil. Beloved, salvation has always been offered to both good and evil. Let's just throw that on the table. In fact, there's none good. There's none righteous. No, not one. We understand that. But because no matter how good a person is, he is still in need of the grace of God. Amen? No matter how evil a person is, he is still in need of the grace of God. Both good and evil, people that think they're good or look even good, or that do good deeds, and then there are evil people that are just evil. It doesn't matter. Both of them need the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what the robe is going to point to. That's exactly what the garment here in the text is going to point us to. I know this is a lot of information, but boy, we have to just get in here and put our boots on, amen? And it all leads to what Christ is saying here. It's, it's no matter how evil a person is, he is still in need of Christ's righteousness. And Paul says that they're not cut off. Israel's still not cut off. And we understand that no one can come to God by their good works. They need Christ and His imputed righteousness. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, Oh, do you not know that the righteousness, uh, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor the infeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. A good and evil. Here, evil and evil. Everyone falls short of what God requires for entrance into the kingdom. And Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like a king and his son. And we're seeing this. But whosoever repents and calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If that is why Paul could say in the next verse, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, and such were some of you, some of us. But we have been washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. 
And so were many of us, so far from God, the God who is rich in mercy, called us from darkness into the marvelous light. And that is the effectual call that every man needs. So then the call went out and people were brought in and the wedding hall was filled with dinner, dinner guests. Finally, finally the king has an audience for his son. Let's look at the next point, the fourth and last scene, the intruder I call this. And I think he's an intruder. Point four, the wrong garment. In verses 11 and 12, but when the king came into, uh, into look over the dinner guest, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And beloved, beloved this is a sad time because this is a picture that one day they will stand before the great judgment and they will not be able to give an excuse. In verse 11, beloved, what every person needs is faith in God's Son as He is the only way, recognizing Him as Lord and His atoning sacrifice. That is His shed blood for the remission of sins for all that believe and come to Christ. Each person who has been called on the name of the, has called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, has been born again, will one day be at this dinner. Not only will they be at the dinner, but they will be a guest at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We await this day. I cannot wait for us to be together on that day as we sing and we worship our great God. So Christ concluded His parable and we need to understand what the picture is, a future banquet that He speaks about. This banquet our Lord speaks of has been prepared for those who have been saved. That would be the invited. And this will be only for those who are prepared to walk into the King's presence with the robe of righteousness. That's Christ's righteousness on. And we read, the King came, the king came and looked over the guests, and he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. So Christ asks the question, well, why? But he had no answer. It has been said by many that the king, in inviting guests to the banquet, would also provide clothes for each one of them to wear. In olden times, in other words, when a king hosted a royal wedding, like what Christ is portraying in the parable, the guests would be provided a festive robe. It says clothes, but in those days when you do some research, a festive robe. And this robe for us represents the robe of righteousness. And this robe of righteousness is Christ. Amen? And in Revelation we read, and so what we ask before we read in Revelation chapter 19, 7 through 10, so what is the problem and what is the picture here? He says, friend, and, he, and the man's not dressed with the proper clothes. And in Revelation chapter 19, 7 through 10, let's, let's look at the spiritual side. And let us rejoice and be glad and give glory, give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her the, to clothe herself in fine linen, a bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, and speaking of those that had been beheaded as well uh, during the tribulation period. And then He said to me, uh, and some of those did go, some were still on the earth. And then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. And then I fell at his feet to worship him. It's such a, wonder, a wonderful thing, John says, that he fell at the feet of the angel. But he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow slave with you and your brothers who have the witness of Jesus. Worship God. For the witness of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Praise be to God. And this is what 
that picture, the kingdom of heaven, is like. It is like this day that we all look forward to. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, washed clean in the blood of Christ, sinless because of Christ, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. How beautiful it is as we, as we think through this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are true words of God. I love that. So God is the author of salvation. When salvation is given to the believer, Christ's righteousness is imputed uh, to the believer as well, which covers and washes away the believer's sins. And the picture starts in Genesis chapter 3, when God shed innocent animals to clothe Adam and Eve. And that's the picture. It started there, and it goes all the way through to the end of our wonderful Bible, Genesis chapter 22. So, in verse 12, and he said to him, friend, how did you come here, come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. The word friend there, we, we use that word a little bit different. But the word friend, Jesus here uses what we would consider, and it is, very kind words. The man was accountable for being dressed in the garment provided, so think with me. And he calls him friend. And it should bring our attention to Judas. When he said to Judas, friend, do what you're going to do and do it quickly. It brings us much sadness. God is a lover of man. God made man in his image. And God is never happy with, the, with, with man not repenting, not turning to Christ, but one day he will judge righteously. When we examine this fact that all the dinner guests dressed in the wedding clothes provided, this tells us that he was aware of what was required. Beloved, a lot of people say, well, you can't really see it in the text. But the text tells us there was one man that was not dressed properly. And that leads us to our thought and the thought that I had given you. God is so gracious to give this man and Israel a chance to justify his actions. He says, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? It's not because God doesn't know the answer. And the man was speechless. How do you answer God? He could not even offer an answer Beloved, he could have had the proper wedding clothes on. He chose not to. Now we're back to the parable. He came on his own terms, and this is what it points to. He came on his own terms. It's the same thing we see in the world. It's the same thing we're seeing in the religious leaders. They're self-righteous. And so he comes in on his, own ther on his own terms, for he walked in his own ways. He was proud and he was self-willed. Is that not the religious leaders? That's exactly what we're seeing. They don't want anything to do with the Messiah. And they will die in their sins. And as we, we, as we will hear, this did not go without notice and it led to judgment. Let's look at our point five of God's judgment in verse 13 and 14. 14. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. And you know that's a picture of hell and a picture of judgment, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever." It's an eternal suffering. Man does not die in heaven and man does not die in hell. He will live eternally either in one place or the other. If he rejects the offer of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then he will die and he will reap what the Scripture says. 
This is a picture of the unsaved at the great white throne judgment. Remember Cain, the first person who by a self-appointed sacrifice thought that he could come to God in his own way. Beloved, that's exactly what we have in front of us. These religious leaders were not going to have any part of him. They rejected him. If you notice here that none of the other guests noticed that the man was not dressed. Beloved, this is because only God knows the heart. Only God knows who truly belongs to Him. The same may be said of the Pharisees and their religious system at the time. And those in the church today, beloved of the Lord, God knows. God knows His own. Many of us cannot tell whether they belong to the Lord or not, but God knows. There are many people that claim to know Christ, but yet there is no Christ in their life, but we still don't know. And of course, we want them to be saved, amen? We want everyone to be saved. We want heaven to be full of worshipers for our Almighty God. Of course, we want every man to come to the saving knowledge of the Lord. I like what Peter called salvation. He called it obedience to the truth. It's the opposite of what we see here in our text. In 1 Peter 1, 22, we read, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a love of the brothers without hypocrisy, fervent love one than another from the heart. And that's what comes out of that. This parable reminds us of what our Lord said on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5.20. And as we bounce back and forth between spiritual and the wedding, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And this man was a picture of, of trying to get to heaven on his own good works. That's never going to happen. It's a picture of Israel, a picture of the Pharisees and the scribes and those that Christ is speaking to. If they think that they can get there their own way, and beloved, they're wrong. There is only one way. And Jesus Christ came to die so that man may have life. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Amen. There's no other way around it. And in our last verse, verse 14, so I think it's time to say in conclusion, for many are called, but few are chosen. Beloved, we can spend the rest of the day here. It's a beautiful picture of God's sovereignty and man's rejection of Christ, the Son of God who came to die so man may be forgiven and redeemed and have eternal life. Beloved, within that call, you can see it. You can see the two calls. You can see it in our verses. The invitation to the king's banquet went out to many. You've seen that in the text. This represents everyone to whom the gospel is sent. That's the overriding picture. Go out into the highways and the byways. Bring them into the church. We should go drag people in. We can't do it, though. We'll get arrested. But few accept the offer of salvation, you see. Not everyone desires God. And sadly, many today who call upon Christ have set their own rules for salvation. And, beloved, we're seeing it, and it breaks our heart. But as we can see in this parable, God has His own terms by which man must enter into His holy presence. As 2 Peter 3, 9 said, The Lord is not slow about His promises, as some consider slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Keeping our parable in context, the proper wedding garment that all men must have when leaving this world is Christ's imputed righteousness, because without it, judgment awaits. We can see that. It is not what the religious leaders taught in Jesus' day or what many teach today that even uh, speaking about Israel, the chosen people, 
of God's covenant nation Israel, because they were related to Abraham by blood, would be included by the Messiah into his millennial reign. And that is taught today, beloved. If you ever witness to the Jews, they believe that they're the chosen people. You would ask them, why would God allow you into heaven? Well, we're, from, we're in Abraham, and we are the chosen people. Therefore, we go in before anyone else. And not so, beloved of the Lord. But Jesus teaches here that whosoever has heard and responded to my invitation of salvation and has called on my name and has submitted to my lordship will be part of of me and my kingdom, and will rule and reign during the millennial reign with Him. And that's what we look forward to. Because the believer is related to Christ by His blood, He has been, He has redeemed us. If they're still in Abraham and they're not in Christ, then they stand in their own righteousness, just like every man, woman, and child today, and judgment awaits. He says this, for many are called, but few are chosen. The general call of salvation goes forth even today in the world we live in, but few are chosen. God is the author of salvation, and Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If that is the effectual call I spoke about today, and I will raise him up on the last day. In John chapter 6, 47 through 48, we read, truly, truly, Jesus says, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Beloved, what a parable that the Lord gives us here today. What a reminder. And we have to cry out. And we have to say, O sinner, do you believe that Jesus came to die so that you may live? Repent and call upon the only name given amongst men whereby we could be saved. In our text today, They refuse to come. I plead with you to come to Jesus. Call out to Jesus. Repent and be saved from the wrath to come. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, if you had not opened our eyes, Father, we would not be able to come. Because of your great call, your effectual call, the call that we received, each one of us differently on a different day, but the same call. Father, you called us out of darkness and you placed us, you justified us, you redeemed us, you sanctified us, and you placed us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And now we have His imputed righteousness. And Father, all because of the work you sent Him to do, To those that still reject Him today, Father, the same words can be preached. They will be cast out into utter darkness. And Father, it is our desire that all of our family, as we were thinking today and thinking about our children, that there is only one way. You have provided that through the life, death, and resurrection, and then the ascension and coronation of your only begotten Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray for strength for each one of the believers that we would tell others about our Lord and Savior, the Jesus Christ, that He is the only way that, that a man could come and have assurance of eternal salvation, all because of the work that He has done on our behalf for all those that He would save. Now, Father, you said that your word would not come back void and that it would have its perfect way. Father, I stand and trust you fully. Whatever it is that you'll do, we thank you in advance and praise you. We worship you in truth and spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're going to close our musical worship and stand amazed before our Savior. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not thy will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful in my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me Marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. His love is wonderful. We shall sing of it for all evermore. Our benediction this week is from Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. God bless. Make it a great week. Amen.